Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. For those that it's Sabbath, it's not Sabbath here, but it will be. And I um, appreciate you all coming uh, to this study on Friday evening. I know for some, you know, we rush to get ready for Sabbath, and uh, it's good to take this time a little bit before Sabbath uh, to study God's Word. Now, the study that we're doing today is number 10 of A.T. Jones' 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And uh, so before we begin reading this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have to study your word. And we invite your presence here as we... Uh, read uh, A.T. Jones' study from your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit can be here to instruct us, that we can have a conviction and a power in our lives uh, to overcome sin. We know, Lord, that we are sinners and um, that we often try to justify ourselves. We ask, Lord, for your power of justification, that we can represent you correctly, that we can um, overcome in those areas that are hidden deep inside of us. We ask that the light of truth can shine upon us and reveal those things in the dark. We pray for each person who's studying these things. We ask that your Holy Spirit can work upon them. And we ask for your angels' care and protection in all that we do. Be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, good evening. It's on oh, no, high. Let's turn it down to low. Okay, so it's just, I don't know if you can hear that fan in the background, but it's fairly loud, so we're going to just turn it down. <clears throat> um, so, A.T. Jones in the 1895 General Conference Bulletin has been um, uh, laying out what, it, what uh, the Protestants and the Catholics are doing. And he's bringing this closer to home as far as what happens within Adventism. And in the last study, he's started on talking about what it means to come out of Babylon. And uh, obviously, it doesn't mean just to leave the Protestant churches. So he's going to expand on that. At the end of the other one, he was talking about dress. And, uh, and so he's going to talk about that in this study as well, just at the beginning to refer back to that previous study. And <clears throat> so we're going to begin reading here what Jones says. I understand there are some who think that I did not say enough about dress last night. I think perhaps that it is that is so because it is altogether likely that those who think I did not say enough about dress would be glad if I had talked about those who dress neatly and even nicely while they themselves think they are all right. Now, I know I read this over myself um, in, uh, in my personal study. So, um, and I think we talked a little bit about that as well, even though we didn't read what Jones said about it. Um, there are people who, when, we, when they see a person dressed neatly and well, take it at once as an evidence of pride. But it is just as much an evidence of pride for a person to be proud of his slovenliness as it is for another person to be proud of his flashiness. I've seen people who are proud of their slovenliness. I've seen people who are proud of their lack of pride. And they were thanking God. They were not proud, but they were. Um, perhaps for that reason, I did not say enough about dress before. And therefore, I would add this. That those who are proud of their lack of pride, and in this pride think they are all right, when they might and ought to dress better or more neatly than they do, would do well to correct themselves and come up to a better standard. However, I was not talking about dress. That was not the subject. I was talking about coming out of Babylon, and I'm talking against idolatry. 
what sacrilege is and what the abhorring of idols is. We had reached in the third chapter of 2 Timothy the word blasphemers, and we cannot take up each one of these words singly, but there are words along throughout the catalog that are worthy to be noticed by us. One here is a step or two along is unthankful. In these last days, people having a form of godliness without the power will be unthankful. Unthankful is not, is not thankful. That is full of thanks. How is it with you? Where do you belong? You are a professor of religion. You profess godliness. Are you full of thanks or are you thankful when everything goes right and um, to suit you? But when things go so as not to suit you, then you are doubtful, fretful, impatient, and wonder what it is to, is to become of you. Are you just discontented and unthankful when such and such things happen? Are you thankful sometimes and unthankful sometimes? If I am thankful sometimes and not thankful at other times, then am I thankful? No, from such turn away. Those who have a form of godliness without the power and go according to feeling have their ups and downs. But God does not wish any Christian to have any ups and downs at all, only ups. He quickens us, that is, gives us life and raises us from the dead to start with. And he intends that we shall keep on going up until we land at the right hand of God. Take the other figure. We are planted. We are called trees. Trees of righteousness, rooted and grounded in the love of God. And that tree is expected to grow and only to grow. Not to grow and then go back. As they told me down in Florida when I was there last fall, some of their orange trees get what they call a dieback. They shoot up, outgrowing all the other trees and then die back. Almost as if not entirely to the ground. The next year, they again shoot up that way, again outgrowing all the trees and then die back. But that is not the kind of trees God has in his orchard. He plants trees of righteousness and expects that they shall be not be up and down, growing up swiftly and dying back, but that they sh shall grow and only grow. Unholy. We all know what it is alone which makes holy. The presence of Jesus Christ. The abiding presence of God alone can make anything, any place, or anything holy. Um, let's take a sec. <clears throat> but those who have the form of godliness without the presence of God are necessarily unholy. And this scripture says, from such, turn away. If I am unholy, from such, I am to turn away. That is, to turn away from myself. The only place we can turn from ourselves is unto God. And that brings the abiding presence of God, which makes holy and which sanctifies. Without natural affection. So these are the lists, right? Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. They have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. How do you treat the children? Of course, our children are not all perfect. They are not all born saints because they are our children. We find many things that are awry about them in their conduct. That is true. And yet, how do we treat them? How do they come up by these crooked ways? How did that meanness that is there get into them? You hear many people say of certain actions or traits in a child, well, that child came honestly by that. Yes, that is true. In fact, is there anything that a child manifests that he did not come by, on, come by honestly by? Surely not. For the child did not bring himself into the world. And I'm not in any sense saying that these traits shall be allowed to run on unchecked. But in checking or correcting them, shall we treat them as though they were altogether responsible for it? Or shall we consider that we ourselves are responsible in some measure for it? Which shall it be? Without natural affection. Or shall we allow that we have something to do with? 
shall we allow that the thing is there by nature and work accordingly, not only with the natural affection, but with the affection of grace divine. Now, um, just touching on this, I want to go to this list uh, that Jones is talk talking about. This is Romans chapter 1. Uh, I believe, is that where it is? I'm trying to remember what the verse, the exact verse is. Romans 1, yeah, verse... Because this is where he's going to talk about um, going back. So I'll just show you the verses here. Um, this is where it talks about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Right? That that verse there. And for it is writ for therein is written, talking about... Uh, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So here he's quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, verse 4. Um, and then it talks about the wrath of God. And it's going to talk about the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, right? And then it's going to talk about the characteristics of those that know not God. Right, so it's going to say they were neither were they thankful, but be, became in their vain in their imaginations. It's going to talk about all these uh, the false worship of idols, right? Um, and uh, is this what I'm looking for? Is this the verse that he's talking on? Because he's going to give this list of of these different things here. Um, so uh, this thing without natural affection, if you look at Romans 1, verse 26, uh, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Right. So if you look at this, these characteristics, um, if we talk about with uh, uh, without natural affection, That's what he what he's talking about here. Covenant breakers without natural affection. Wouldn't this be talking about uh, what he's talking about earlier? You understand what I'm saying? Now, now it's different words in the Greek. So I don't know, maybe I'm reading into this part here. What was the question? What were you? Well, the question is when it talks being without natural affection. Oh, okay. Right. So in this yeah. list in Romans, we're going to have a similar list. Um, the other place is in... Uh, 2 Timothy 3, right? So he's talking about this in 2 Timothy 3. Um, right? This is, um, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, that's uncontrolled, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, 
but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. He's going to give more descriptions. So here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have this connection with Romans chapter 1. So we can see these are both giving us a list of characteristics of those that have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. So both of them have this without natural affection. Both of these verses. And But he's going to talk about uh, affection, though it's a different word, early in Romans, which is talking about homosexuality, right? So that word there um, is just, it's, uh, where's the word? Um, which refers to passion or lust. Here in, when it says without natural affection, um, so they're they're um, cherishing affectionately, right? So if somebody's without natural affection, they they don't have normal feelings. But this could be feelings. Is that? I just said it falls under a lot of different things. Pedophile and a lot of different things. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is uh, so I think that this is. I mean, it could just be without natural affection. Just refers to refers to the fact that we. We, uh, you know, people who are narcissistic, who don't have normal emotions. Yeah, that's true. That could be true. It'd be referring to that. Um, and implacable, um, that is somebody that can't be uh, placated, that is, they can't be, um, uh, but you can't think of another word for it. Um, they can't be convinced or entreated or satisfied, right? Um, and, and show no mercy, right? So there's all this list of these different things in Romans. And you can see how that list is very similar to what he has in Second Timothy chapter 3, right? Yeah, they're similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is... This is the situation we see in this world today. <clears throat> but the thing is, we don't just see it in the world. We see it in ourselves. We see it in the church. We see it in the Adventist church. We see it in this movement, and we see it in ourselves. These are characteristics of this world. So it's easy to, to see it in someone else. But we can well, we have, have to, We have to see it in ourselves. Holy Spirit has to. Yeah, it doesn't really do us any good to see it in someone else. I mean, no, not really. <laughs> from such turn away. I mean, obviously, we don't want to uh, be following, but he's actually not saying of such persons turn away, in my understanding of it. Just puts more helium in my head, that's all. Yeah, it's the way that I read this of such, from such turn away. So that's. Um, I'm just going to see what, what, what that so that's verse 5 you know having a form of godliness but deny the power thereof from such turn away so that's just two Greek words and that means turn away and um from these, right? So from such things, you need to turn away from. It's not really say, saying here, in my understanding of, of this verse, that it's telling us that we need to turn away from these types of people, right? That in the last days, there's all these types of people and don't associate with them. It's not what it's saying, in my view. It's saying, here is the characteristics that exist in the world at the last days and don't have these characteristics in yourself. Right? Yeah, I would agree. Because it's easy to say, well, just don't associate with them. But that's not really what he's saying in the Greek. From, from these turn away, not from these people, 
but from these characteristics. Okay, so we'll go back to Jones here, just but I wanted to look at that, these two different uh, passages that are parallel. All right, so he's dealing with natural affection is how we treat our children and how we treat those around us. Um, um, so then he goes on about truce breakers. Now, a truce is made when two armies are at war. A flag is sent out by one or the other. A flag of truce, truce it is called. A truce is a law in warfare, a stopping of hostilities. It may be for the burial of the dead. It may be for a parley as to peace. It may be for one reason or another. But a truce is a stopping of all warfare and all contention by those who had formerly been at war. If it is for the burial of, of the dead, they can mix right in one with the other, sit down and talk together. Everything, perfect peace. But when the truce is over, the war begins again. The scripture says, speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, but gentle showing all meekness unto men. There is a truce now, but what before? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That is how we used to be. And he that hates, his, hates has broken the commandment, which says, thou shalt not kill. Formerly, there were contention, strife, envy, jealousy, emulation, wrath, seditions, heresies, murders, and all these things. That is the way it was before. Now we have found Christ professed to, and that calls for peace, and that is the truce. That is accepted among Christians, among those who have named the name of Christ. Therefore, after naming the name of Christ and professing to be his, the man who indulges any envy, any malice, any hatred, any backbiting, any evil speaking, any division, what is he? He is a truce breaker. He has broken the truce that he has professed in the very name and profession of godliness. Have you ever found in your experience among the churches in our own denomination any envy, jealousy, talking against one another, backbiting, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, divisions, or any such thing? That is truce breaking. Are you one of these? From such, turn away. False accusers. The next expression comes inevitably. Truce breakers, false accusers. And the Greek word, the Greek for that word, false accusers, is diaboloi. Uh, I'm not sure I pronounced it. I'm terrible at pronouncing Greek. But uh, you can see the word devils. Because the Greek for the devil is diabolos, the accuser, the chiefest of all accusers among those who do, who do accuse. You remember in the 12th of Revelation, it says of him, the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That is the devil himself, the chief accuser. And here in the word which we are studying, it is expressed in the plural, diaboloi, devils. That is, they follow the ways of the devil, the chief accuser, and thus are called devils, also false accusers. Now, I'm not calling them devils. I'm calling your attention to the fact that the Lord calls them devils. False accusers. Are you one? Now, we are studying Babylon and what it is to come out of Babylon. I have a little extract here that gives some idea of how it is really in Babylon where the mother of harlots is, where Babylon, the mother, sits in Rome itself. And that will be an illustration of what this signifies here and what is pointed out in the words truce breakers and false accusers. Cardinal Gibbons last year, shortly after his return from Rome, gave an interview to the correspondent of the New York World. And so that would be, uh, uh, I guess... I'm not sure, the correspondent of the New York world, that must be a paper or something. It didn't, they didn't put it in italics, though, so I'm not sure why. And anyway, uh, the interview was reprinted in the Catholic Standard in the month of October in 1894, and here is a statement from the interview. 
In talking, his eminence weighs his words nicely. Although he has no shadow of reserve when he is dealing with people in whom he has confidence, he is nice in the expression of his views. He once assured me that the pleasure he derived from seeing Rome was greatly lessened by the necessity of keeping guard upon his tongue. In the strange air of Rome, as he explained, your lightest words are caught up, commented, and misinterpreted. I am accustomed to say what I think plainly and directly in our American way, he added. But in Rome, how could he not do that? How is it in Battle Creek? How is it in Oakland? How is it in College View? How is it in any church? How is it in the church where you belong? Is there such perfect confidence in you as a brother with all the others um, to whom you speak that no word is caught up, commented, and misinterpreted? Or is there such a thing as catching up words, making a man an offender for a word, not taking time to understand what he said, not knowing whether you heard the thing distinctly or not, you caught some kind of indistinct sound and it did not strike you exactly right. And then you must hurry to the president of the conference or some other brother in important position and tell him, oh, such and such a brother said so and so. How can you have him in the ministry? How can you support a man that holds such doctrines as that? Have you ever seen any such thing as that? I'm simply asking these questions. You can decide. You can tell whether it is so or not. And if that is the way it is in Battle Creek or any other place among Seventh-day Adventists, then where is the difference on this point between this and the very seat of Babylon itself, Rome, where your words are caught up, commented, and misinterpreted? If this is so. Is it not time to come out of Babylon? Is it not time from such, from such to turn away? Um, I find such a connection with Jesus Christ, such an abiding confidence, and faith in him that there shall be perfect Christian confidence among all who profess the name of Christ, that your words shall not be cut up, caught up, commented, and misinterpreted. Now, the thing is, we've seen this in this movement. I mean, I've had many times where something that I said was reported to someone. I've had things that I supposedly said, Heidi and I said, that were reported to Jeff or others um, and carried to people. And, and of course, were complete misrepresentations of, of any intention behind what was said. But the thing is, that's, we have that's, all done That's aggravating. Oh, well, it's aggravating. But the thing is, we have all done it. Yeah. We've, somebody that's say that's something. And, and we, instead of talking yeah. to that person, and having exaggerate, the, yeah, exaggerate just a little bit, you know, that's all you have to do. Well, exaggerate, and, exaggerate you, just a little bit, you know. Well, you don't even need to exaggerate, you can just take the words out of their context. Right. Right. So so and, and they can often be the exact words that you said. And somebody can say, Well, you said these exact words. And and I can say, Yes, I said those exact words. But they don't mean what you you're saying they mean, and and some people have said, well, you know, your words, you know, words only have one meaning. I had somebody say that one time. Um, it was actually Tabo who said that. Now, you know, maybe I'm taking what he said out of context. But the idea was that you know, if you said something, you have to stick to those words exactly as I interpret them. You can never explain your words. And, and of course, we know the problem with language is it's, it's not as clear cut as just words only have one meaning. Words can have a variety of meanings. And if you take a word out of context, it could easily be misconstrued. So well, for they, do that, they do that with Sister White, too. Well, I always use the example of Paul and... and, and um, um, my, my name is the name escapes me right now. Um, uh, uh, James, right? 
So it's in the book of James, where he talks about, uh, what does he say? Um, let's see if I can spell this right. So that's going to be, let me see here. So James 2.24 uh, and Galatians 3.24. So those should be easy to remember. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And then James, that's Paul. And then James says, you see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? So if we were to t say that words only have one meaning, we would have to say that James and Paul contradicts each other, right? Yeah, yeah, so I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah Iran, Iran brings up this uh, 2 Peter 3.16, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now we know um, uh, Paul had his words misconstrued. Uh, even when he wrote to Thessalonians the first time, um, there was things that he, he said that people had misinterpreted, so he had to clarify them in 2 Thessalonians. So often we have to clarify our words, but especially when somebody is looking to take up, comment on, and misinterpret our words because of envy and jealousy and um, all of these motives that people can have. So when somebody isn't willing to accept your explanation of what you have said, and that, that's the worst thing, that sometimes people can misunderstand what you've said, and they might tell some other people, but if they come to you, or if you go to them because you've heard them saying that you said such and such, and now you say, well, here's the context and here's what I meant, and they don't accept your explanation for what you said, that's definitely not Christian. Right? If you didn't, no, say, right. If you didn't say something and they, they can't allow you to explain what you meant, it's definitely unchristian to not allow you to say what you meant. Now, um, you know, sometimes we'll have situations where, and I've had these situations where I've said something, um, and those words that I said um, maybe even completely misspoke. And um, I, I don't mean anything against women here, but... but I know there's many guys who have said something just because they jumbled up their words and their wife or girlfriend uh, says, you can't take that back because, you know, that those, those words, even though you didn't mean to say them, they must be what you really think. I don't know if anybody's had that experience. I see that on the news all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, but in relationships, <laughs> yeah, sometimes... Oh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes really people who don't want you to be able to retract even a word that's misstated because it somehow reveals what you actually think, right? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and of course, that's completely unfair, as we know, because people can misspeak. And it doesn't mean that I actually think what, you know, what I misspoke. Right? So... But anyway, this is this is a situation where we have to be careful about how we represent what other people have said. Right. We have to be careful about it. It's easy to just say, well, you know, this person said this. And, and so you have to be careful about it. It's like when I look at Parminder's uh, statements that he made during that question and answer. I make sure that I give enough context. I mean, I could just take some of the words and say, he, he said this. Um, 
but I want people to see the context and also watch the video and look for themselves. What is he saying? And of course, Parminder's is saying what he's saying. But we still have to be careful that we represent people correctly. <clears throat> now, it is true that the Christian is to be so absolutely th truthful, frank, and open-hearted that we need not, he need not care and is not to care what people make out of his words. But what if what of those who profess to be Christians that are ready to make such things out of his words? Right. So what he's saying here, if you're open and honest, even though people misrepresent you, you really don't need to care about that. But the real concern is those that profess to be Christians that are ready to make such things out of his words. That is the question. And if that is so in the churches where you belong, then from such turn away. I mean, if you are one of these from yourself, turn away. That is, if you have that characteristic, you need not have that characteristic. You need to stop doing it. Now, we have false accusers, incontinent, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady. Now, heady. So he's going to focus on that. There is an expression that is common among people today that express the same thing. It is the phrase big head, heady. The information all lies in the head. All they know is in their head, and they think there is so much of it that they wonder that even their head can hold it. But that is one of the characteristics of the last days. People will be heady, that is, they have knowledge in their heads. But God wants hardy people in these days. Instead of people having the big head, he wants them to have a big heart. God gave Solomon largeness of heart like the sands of the seashore, and the exhortation is to us all in Corinthians be ye also enlarged. God wants large-hearted people, hardy people, not heady people. And there are no two ways about it. The testimonies have told us often enough and plainly enough that there is entirely too much theory among Seventh-day Adventists and not enough experience of the love of Christ uh, in the heart. Too much dogma and not enough of the Spirit of God. Too much form and too little real practical experience in the power of God and of the truth working in the heart and shining abroad in the life. From such, turn away. Let God have all the heart that he may enlarge it in the filling of, uh, filling of it with all his fullness. Okay. Now, I just want to look at this word, heady. Um, so so this Greek word here for heady um, and I think there's there might be a little bit more to it than what Jones is talking about though I, I get his point um So let me see here. Like the idea, uh, heady, it means to fall forwards, headlong, sloping, precipitously, precipitate, being rash, being reckless. And um, so the idea here of heady is um, that a person is uh, reckless. So, I mean, I understand what he's saying about being heady in the sense of all in your head. But these are people who it would have to do with rashness. Does that make sense? Right. So they're rash. Um, and then we have high mind. So the next word comes logically from this. It is the consequence of this, just as false accusers come from truce breakers. These are heady, high-minded. There's a word upon, upon this in the 12th chapter of Romans uh, 16th verse. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. How is it in our work in Bible readings, tent readings, and so on? Are we glad when some of the rich folks come out, some of the best society, 
and seem to be favorable to the truth. And we, and we do think now we are doing some great thing. And another man, as James described him, a poor man in vile raiment comes into the tent and his appearance is not altogether in his favor. And we say to the man of the gay clothing, oh, come here, here's a seat for you. And the other man, oh, we don't know him at all. How is it? James says that is respect of persons. Have you respect of persons? If you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You cannot do it. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. I'm not saying that we shall slight the rich or those of the best society. Not that at all. They are to be called to Christ and be converted just as much as anybody else. What I am asking is, are we courting these and thinking some great thing is done when one of these shows some interest or favor toward us in the, or the truth while disregarding or slight, slighting the poor and the outcast? There's no respect of persons with God. If you have respect of persons, you commit sin. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, of course, this is, um, it's easy to see this in other people. We can see it in the Adventist church. Um, and why would that be? Why is it they're looking to, when some important person, in quotation marks, has shows an interest in the truth, uh, why is that a bigger issue? than just some poor person, somebody of low estate. What would be one of the motives? And take an interest in the the uh, well-off person. Yeah. Why? Why would we as opposed to as opposed to the poor person? Yeah. I think people are looking for status you know people that i don't know well status and money money yeah yeah so an example i can give back in uh, 1988 when we started some self-supporting work in alberta um <clears throat> we had uh i was living at a, in a house with uh this other guy who had started the work so he had been called to offered some land and a house and uh and then he called me to come and move in with him me and my family and um this uh one day we had a visitor knock at the door and this visitor was not dressed very well i mean i wouldn't say that he was like messy or anything but he had old clothes on and 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 you know and he was a conservative adventist an old man and he was dressed in clothes that probably had had for a long time, but he was dressed nicely. He wasn't wearing like a jeans and t-shirt. He, he was dressed up, but they were old shabby clothes. I mean, they weren't, they weren't expensive clothes. At least they might've been at one time, but they no longer were of any value. And um, uh, this other guy who had started this work, he seemed to have no interest in talking to this person at all, um, which I was surprised of. Because the way I grew up, I mean, you just you treat everyone the same, and and so I spent time talking to the guy, and uh, um, he even wanted some jars of applesauce uh, that had there was a little bit of mold on. We'd got some applesauce out, and there was a bit of mold on the top, and he says, "Well, that's fine. You can just scrape that off." He's, I said, "Well, I don't want it," but he says, "Well, I'll take it." And anyway, you know, I talked to him, visited with him for a while. And he was just asking us about this work that we were doing. And then, um, you know, we, we talked for an hour or so. And my friend had no interest in talking to this guy. Well, it turns out later, this guy was extremely wealthy. And the reason he was there was to see whether he was interested in giving us money to support us in our work. Yeah. But, you know, my friend just judged him by his appearance. And um, he ended up putting his money some other direction because of how he was treated. Um, you know, because I wasn't the main guy running the work; I was just one of the people invited there. But so, so you know, you should always treat everyone as if I mean, people have entertained angels unaware. 
right? So yeah, we, that's another, that's another thing. <laughs> so we all know these things. But the, but the real point is that there's no more value in someone because they're rich or because they're famous or anything like that. Um, every soul well, is... In, about, in their heart and mind, you know, that's what Christ looked at. Yeah. And even though that person may be, you know, worldly, they may appear worldly, they may like somebody who's just coming to Christ, um, that often they can be sort of treated poorly. We don't know what that person's life is going to be like once they know Christ. So, right. but the thing is, the world is interested in those that are famous, those that are wealthy, those that have high status. Um, but we're not supposed to be that way. So from such a way. Um, there's another verse in um, Philippians that touches the same thing with an exhortation to us all. That's Philippians 2, verse 3 to 6. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let us esteem others better than ourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was high, became low, that he might lift up the lowest. Right? So, and that was the complaint against him in his day. Oh, this man, why he goes in with publicans and sinners and eats with them. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I need not call any further attention to that. Brother Prescott's lesson last night is full enough on that particular point. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. Now, there is another text upon this particular phase of the study as to what it is to come out of the world and wherein the world lies and wherein we are connected with the world. Turn to James 4.4. 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Does not that call upon everyone to ask himself, have I a friendship for the world? Not have I more friendship for the world than I have for the Lord? Have I any of it at all? For whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That is written and that is so. See how he starts out with it too, the adulterers and adulteresses. Let us look at that expression and see what that means in connection with Babylon. Right in that expression, we can find how Babylon originated and was built up. Turn to Romans 7, verse 1 to 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Know that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman, which hath a husband, is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye shall be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. The one who professes the name of Christ stands in the place where his profession declares that he is married to Jesus Christ as the wife is married to the husband. Now, the wife who has a husband and sets her mind upon another man and puts her dependence upon another man, what is she? You know, her husband is there all the time. The husband is living and living with her. Our husband is alive. And he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He is not like a human husband that is sometimes called, called away for a long time. But even though the, the human husband be called away for a long time, that does not justify the wife in putting her dependence upon another man. But there is this heavenly husband to whom we are united as a wife in the marriage relation. He has come from heaven to draw us away from the world, away from the God of this world and all connection with the world unto God. Christ says, I'm not of this world. He is the second Adam. The first man, the first Adam, 
is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are of the earth. And as is the heavenly, such as they also that are of the heavenly. Our husband is of heaven and is only heavenly. When he was in the world, he was not of the world. He put no dependence upon the world. He had no connection whatever with it, as it is the heavenly. Such are they also that are of the heavenly. Here are we then joined to that heavenly husband in that heavenly relation. And the one who professes this and then has his mind, his affections, his friendship toward the world and upon the world, what is that? That is violative. I don't know if that's how you say it. Violative of that marriage relation. That is what is meant when the word says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. That is so with the individual. What then is of a combination of individuals composing a church? An individual connected with Christ has an individual Christian experience and holds an individual con Christian connection. A whole combination of these connected with Christ form the church of Christ and should have a church experience and a church connection. Take then one of these individuals who has turned away from Christ, the true husband and the rightful Lord, has friendship for the world, puts his dependence upon the kings of this world, he is an adulterer, as in the text. Put with him a whole combination of persons who are doing like that, making a church also of that kind, that is, what made Babylon the mother, committing fornication with the kingdoms of this world, the ways of this world, putting her dependence upon the governments and the combinations of this world. Therefore, the next expression we see in the scriptures describing her is where she has committed fornication with the kings of the earth and sits upon a scarlet colored beast, having in her on her forehead a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She sets the wicked example and other churches, professedly Protestant, have followed the evil example and so have become daughters of that base lineage. Now, if we look at the Seventh-day Adventist church, we know that the Seventh-day Adventist church has, I'm going to use the word bragged, um, they made a big deal about the fact that they, uh, they um, comply with the laws of the land, even in places where it hinders uh, their ability to spread the gospel, such as in Russia. They don't have any problem in Russia. They're not worried about the Russian government taking away their churches or their schools because they're going to come. They're going to comply to the restrictions that the government places upon them. That is, they're not going to evangelize. Right. They're not going to do all these things that that the gospel commission commands of us to do because the government's going to take away their churches. And so. They want to maintain their institutions, so they comply. And they brag on this, that what happened to Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia will not happen to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But we can see that that's just a connection with the world. It's a dependence upon the world, right? When the disciples were told not to proclaim the gospel, what did they do? Did they comply? No, no, no. They went ahead and did what that they what they followed the commission that Christ had given. Now, of course, we can see this in the church, but we can have dependence upon the world in lots of different ways. I know Three ABN still has their uh, ministry over there. Three ABN, yeah. Okay. On TV and TV. But yeah. The no door-to-door -door evangelism. Yeah. Well, the churches themselves, I mean, they don't really have, I'm not sure how they do the, the 3ABN. That's just a, a satellite ministry. But um, 
But uh, the point is, you know, how do we depend upon the world? You know, do we set our our trust in the institutions of the world? Do we look for justice in this world? Do we sue each other? Do we seek to have our rights uh, supported by the state? Do we look to God to protect us? Or do we look to man? Now, we can also have worldly ideas that um, we follow the crowd, right? That's a form of dependence upon the world instead of on Christ. So the Protestant churches have, have taken their position. Adventists have taken their position. We often take our positions based on self-preservation. Anyway, Jones goes on, he says, so you see that the very thing that James refers to, which causes him to use the terms adulterers and adulteresses, this friendship with the world by those professing the name of Christ, that is what made Babylon at the beginning, and it is what makes Babylon the mother and the daughters and the whole combination of Babylon. It is the professed church of Jesus Christ having the form of godliness without having the power but having friendship for the world, having connection with the world, leaning upon the kingdoms and the ways of the kingdoms of this world and not upon the strong, loving arm of her rightful husband. Friendship with the world contains in itself all that Babylon is. It is enmity with God. Therefore, you can see that every consideration, every principle on which a scripture touches demands merely in the named principle utter separation from the world and all there is of it but when the world is in this condition and all going away from god and being gathered together to be pitted against the lord against his christ in the persons of those whose names are written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world of all times that ever were on the earth now is the time when these scriptures are to have living force and living power with those who name the name of Christ and especially with those whose names are written in the book of life now note we have studied so far what Babylon is and what it comprehends and we find that it comprehends the whole world therefore what is what it is to come out of her is is nothing less than to come out of the world and we have lately what it is to come out of the world must have, we have seen lately what it is to have come out of the world and it is certain that it is to be utterly separate from the world and all that is in it having no connection with it whatever the next inquiry is to be how is this to be accomplished god has made complete provision for this that provision is all ready for our acceptance. And now as we enter upon the study of this part of the subject, we are to know that every heart that will receive the word of God in the spirit of Christ with the submission that is called for, the Lord himself will cause that truth to do the very thing that is needed for every such one who will so receive it. That truth will separate us indeed. It will do this work for us. We cannot do it ourselves. We cannot separate ourselves from ourselves. But God has a truth that will do that thing, and it will separate us from ourselves, deliver us from this present evil world, deliver us from sin in the abstract, not simply from individual sins, but from sin, so that sin shall not have power over us, but that the power of God will work in its place. God has a truth in his word that will do just the thing and will lift us so above the world that we shall dwell in the light of the glory of God and of the kingdom of God. That power will be upon us and in us and about us so that we shall go forth to the work to which we are called to do the work that God has to, has to do and to sound loudly the message of warning and the call that is now to be given to all, come out of her, my people. 
Now, this is the commission that we have been given at this time. Can we agree with that? But this is the message that this movement is to give. Yeah. Because this movement is about preparing the people for the Sunday law. Now, when we say come out of her, my people, this would include calling everyone. Because come out of, Laod every come out of Laodicea could be her too. Laodicea yeah. Her. But but we're in Babylon, right? The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not Babylon. Right. But you can be in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and be in Babylon. We're sipping on the wine of Babylon. Being in your Babylonian captivity, right? You need to be called out of Babylonian captivity. That's yeah, where the illustration comes from. Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues, Right. So we're not calling right. Babylon out of Babylon. We're calling God's people out of Babylon. Now, for Seventh-day Adventists who think that they're all right, which is pretty much all of us, even if we're not officially in the church, we still think we're all right because we're Laodiceans. We need to recognize our actual state. And in order to call people out of Babylon, we ourselves have to be out of Babylon. This movement cannot do its work while we have all of these characteristics that Jones has laid out. When we, or even some of these characteristics, if these exist within our movement, within us, we can't fulfill this commission. We can't fulfill this work that God has given us to do, the work to which we are called. We cannot give that call unless we are completely out ourselves. I cannot call a man out from the world when I am not out from it myself. I cannot bring a man to see what separation from the world is. I cannot do it with the truth of God, even unless I see and know by my own experience what separation from the world is. I cannot call people to be utterly separated from the world or anything in it and have them put their dependence absolutely upon God and nothing else. When I'm connected with the world myself, it cannot be done. You can say the words which say to them come out, but there will be no power in the words which reach them to bring them out as only the power of God can. And they cannot come out themselves. Now, if we bring people into our group, into our movement, and they see how we treat one another. Do you think they would have any desire or any belief that we have anything to offer them? Well, they'd probably say, well, that's how my family acts or that's how people I know act. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and they, act the same, they act the same way. <laughs> right. Now I've had many situations, which, um, and I've had this happen in the Adventist church where, there will be somebody, and I've had this, I'll give this example. I was teaching Sabbath school, and there was a person who didn't particularly like me who brought some people to that Sabbath school class. And <clears throat> these were not Adventists. And I was sharing something about uh, the Sabbath school lesson. Particularly, I was talking about... Um, it was a Sabbath school lesson, and we were studying the book of John, and we were starting with uh, John chapter 1. So it was the beginning of a new quarter, and uh, this would have been back probably in uh, 2002, 2003. I can't remember which quarter it was. But, but anyway, um, this, this quarterly was telling us that the logos, right, um, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is logos there. And they were saying that this was a Greek god, right? Um, some kind of minor Greek god, that's what logos was. And of course, that was completely false um, in the quarterly. And I pointed this out, that the quarterly was presenting something I'd never seen presented ever in any commentary. And so I was critical of the quarterly. And of course, this person who had brought these, these people 
who weren't Adventists, you know, to this Sabbath school lesson, he started arguing with me. And because he was offended that I would question the quarterly. That's one of the reasons why he hated me, because um, I would always question the quarterly, which he took as, you know, the word of God if it was in the quarterly. Now, of course, these people, because of me arguing with his friend, um, he, he, he said they didn't want to ever come to church again, and it was my fault. Right. That don't sound fair. <laughs> <laughs> but if he, right, and I'm, I'm not trying to say that I was in the right or in the wrong. I'm just saying that if he really cared about those people who were there, he wouldn't have started an argument in church. Right. I mean, they probably had no idea what I was talking about anyway. All they knew is that their friend who brought them was arguing with me. And obviously they sided with their friend. They didn't want to go to a church where somebody would argue with somebody they cared about, right? I mean, well, we've had many similar situations, even in this movement, even in our studies, where people will say, well, we can't have this discussion now because we brought somebody to these meetings. And yet the way that they are acting, and I'm not, you know, trying to justify myself from what I did and said. But, but we are acting unchristlike in front of people who are of the world, right? And, and we think that we're going to give them a message to come out of Babylon. But there will not be any power in those words if they don't see it in us first, right? Right. So, so what's the point? I mean, if we can't treat each other in a Christ-like manner, uh, it, it's easy just to blame the other person, right? To say, well, you know, you shouldn't have brought up this point or you shouldn't have argued. Um, well, Iran says then we'd have to say, let's go out of Babylon together. I mean, maybe that, that could be a message, I guess, in that situation. But the reality is we want to call people out of Babylon. And they want to see in us evidence that that we are out of Babylon, right? They want to see something in us. As we read in a previous lesson, as we read in a previous lesson, it is the voice from heaven that calls the people out of Babylon. And it is certainly true that from this time forward, we are to be so connected with heaven in our work that when we speak the word of God, the people shall hear the voice from heaven which will fulfill the design of the solemn call. And in the line of truth that is to come in the next division of the subject, his further studies, God will so connect with heaven everyone who will receive it, that he shall find heaven upon the earth. God wants our days, especially from this time forward, to be as the days of heaven upon the earth, according to the scripture. And he will cause this to be so with everyone who will yield fully to God, and to his truth, and hear the voice from heaven. Therefore, I would ask that between this and the next lesson, all will set their minds and their hearts solemnly and sacredly to preparation for what the Lord has to say, for all that he will give us and for all that he will do for us. God has important truth for us, which will do the great work that must be done for us. And we need to have everything surrendered to him, saying, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And when he speaks, drop everything except the word, because it is the word of God, and that word will raise us above the world. Then, when God has raised us, we can shine. Now, we talked about this in our movement, is you know God's going to lift us up as an enzyme. But that can only happen as if, if we're Christ's, if we have a Christ-like character. And, and definitely this movement was not ready to be lifted up as an enzyme. Just like the disciples were left up as, lifted up as an enzyme and, and uh, pioneers, some pioneers were lifted up as an enzyme. Yeah. No, we, we are not truly converted, and we have to recognize that. <laughs> 
So um, that's why we're studying Joan's message, which is so much present truth for this time, for this movement. Okay. Um, any, any final comments about this study? Anybody have any comments? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's straightforward. Definitely. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study, for the time that we have had together. And we ask that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing to each one. Help us to follow and serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.